Hello everyone, welcome back to the Genesis Bench. Tonight, this afternoon, sorry, I'm going to have a quick look at these delightful new weathering products that I obviously needed. And I'm also going to talk some about my Zvezda C130 build, its progress, and a few of the good and less good things that I've picked up about it so far, at least. Um, I am a long way from done, as you shall see shortly. So, uh, this week I bought some new weathering products, which I saw on the Models for Sale website and thought, oh, what is that? Streaking brusher. What on earth is that? Why do we need a streaking brusher? Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to get one and try it. So that's what I'm going to do here today. Um, whilst browsing those, I also spotted the OK Interactive Weathering Pencils. Now, I have seen these before at a show, but I didn't buy any. Um, but this set of five pencils was a fiver, and I thought, let's have a look at it, see what see what it's all about. So we'll have a look at those as well. Just pop those to one side for a moment. So streaking brushes then, let's start there. Obviously, hopefully we're all familiar with the already quite popular oil brushes and probably most of us have still got at least a few traditional oil paints as well. And you know, I've I've started to use oil paints a lot more for weathering effects and shading and what have you on models. So uh, as I've gotten into doing that more and more, I've tried the oil brushes. I like them. So I saw the streaking brush and I thought, well, what do you know? What's this then? So first things first, it's obviously the same packaging as the oil brusher. Um, quite a handy little tube with a brush in the lid so what's in there so immediately on shaking it you can hear that it's a bit runnier there's definitely some sloshing there but this has got more it's a bit runnier than the oil brush so when I take took it out I mean this is exactly the same packaging it's got the kind of sort of seal effect in the in the nozzle there so that uh, the paint doesn't go anywhere I'll give it a little sniff um, I always sniff everything. If I don't know what something is, I always sniff it. Uh, and usually you can get an idea of roughly where it's coming from when you do that. And um, by doing the sniff test, uh, I could straight away see that the streaking brusher is, again, based on the oil product as this is. It smells the same, but this is thinner. As with the oil brusher, the included brush is pretty pointless. It's, it is a nice thing to have. But in all honesty, putting putting the product onto your model with this brush is, is yeah, not ideal. So I'm going to pop a bit of that on there. And I'll immediately grab a cocktail stick before it has a chance to dry. And let's see how much it moves. Quite far. It's fairly thin. I might zoom in a touch, actually. I'll go the wrong way first because you have to. So there we go. This this isn't paper, incidentally. This is like a plasticized paper pad. That's the it's actually a wet palette booklet from um, Games Workshop. So it's ideal for testing this kind of thing. So this this is the streaking brusher, and hopefully you can have some idea there of how thin that is. It's essentially. It's a little thicker than your average wash, but it's quite thin. In comparison, if we go with the oil brusher, uh, I've used the same colour. See how much less far that drags out due to its relatively less viscosity. It's about twice as far. And then just finally, just to characterise fully, I'm not I'm not going to squeeze this straight out of the tube, but I'll get some on here. And uh yeah, you know, you can you could build things with this. See how much thicker that is. 
So in summary, streaking brusher, do you need it? Probably not. Um, I tend to use, when I'm ever doing anything with oil brushes, I love oil brushes. Um, I've got quite a few now. I think they're really convenient. Um, but I will use them in conjunction with a, a palette like this. And I'll put some in that, or a piece of plastic like this. I'll put something on there and I'll use an actual decent paintbrush to apply the product because the included paintbrushes are, are just they're just not very good honestly the idea is is great um but but in application uh missed the mark a little bit and that's just because the quality of the included brush is isn't quite there and i've completely lost my zoom control to come back out we really need to find a remote that works with this camera there we go let's pop back out a bit yeah the, the brush is is a bit too agricultural um to really satisfy the um the ideal behind these but the product is is spot on so this uh going from thickest the oil in the in the um tube is obviously the thickest and quite frankly this in this form isn't particularly useful you'll tend to want to thin it down a bit whenever you use it so the oil brush comes in comes to the rescue there by already being that bit thinner so you can apply this directly to a model i mean and if i do use this brush what i'll tend to do when applying it directly to a model is literally just put tiny little dots wherever i think i want it and then blend it out with a normal paintbrush. So the streaking brusher just goes one further by thinning, thinning it down just that little bit more. Uh, this is somewhere in consistency, probably halfway between the oil brusher and a wash. So if you actually want to make streaking effects, this is going to be a slightly easier product to start with. What I would say, though, however, in summary, is if you already own oil brushes, there's little benefit to be had from buying streaking brushes as well. Because if, like me, you use the product from a palette anyway, you'll thin it down as required for each particular job as you go along. So save yourself three quid and just extend your oil brusher collection uh, and use your enamel thinner or your thinner for washes to uh, thin the product down as you want it to make that streaking effect. So that's that. Um, the pencils then, I was quite intrigued by that. This is something I've never really, it's never really dropped into my arsenal is the whole using a pencil for chipping idea. Um, I, I bought a Prismacolor type pencil a long, long time ago to use for chipping. Uh, and I tried to use it and it, it just, for me, it just didn't work. I've seen decent results that other people have managed to achieve, but for me, it just wasn't happening. So I thought, for a fiver, I'll give these a little look. This set is a metallic set, metal, metallic effects. You get aluminium, gold, dark aluminium, which is a kind of gunmetal shade, bronze and copper in here. And I thought that might be quite interesting. And I've, I've tried using them. This is my, by now, by now you're all familiar and you know Dottie well. She, she pops up in my videos a lot, but it's my, this is my test mule. Uh, and this has got all kinds of matte finishes on it. Uh, so I got a silver pencil and I just started to, I'm almost tapping it onto the surface because as you can see this point isn't what you'd call sharp and on that matte surface uh, the most delightfully subtle and small scratches and chips appear in the finish uh, which I have to say I'm quite impressed with it it works for an aircraft model where chipping if you want it at all really could do with being somewhat more subtle than your average tank model. Are you going to focus? There you go. See around that circular panel? 
It's just some little tips. It does work. I also did some around here along this edge. You can use the side of the pencil, run along a corner, so like a cockpit sill. Just run along a corner with the edge. Simplicity itself, it works. It's much, much easier than trying to apply a chip with a paintbrush, no matter how fine the paintbrush is, because you're always at the mercy of the viscosity of the paint and how quickly it's drying out, uh, which can make things really, really awkward, I find. Uh, so for chipping on aircraft models, I've always defaulted to actually using chipping methods, hairspray and the like, um, which works, but is quite um, time consuming. And getting consistent results with the hairspray and, uh, and other chipping methods can, can be a little bit hit and miss in my, in my experience. Uh, so I'm quite pleased I picked this up. Um, I will look, next time I do some metallic work on a model, I will look at using these potentially to add some sort of shading, dare I say it, in, into a metallic finish as well. But in the meantime, the aluminium pencil for chipping for aircraft models, I think, could be really quite handy. So there's that. So, yeah, glad I picked those up. Um, at this point, I'd cautiously recommend that if if you find you're interested in that kind of thing. I'll caveat, I'll caveat that with not having tried the coloured ones in any way, shape or form. I'm not really sure what you would use those for. These are not water soluble, I don't think. So there's that. Anyway, the main event tonight, I bring you the Zvezda C-130. I've been quietly working away on this. I have lost a lot of ground to Mr. Manton due to taking a week out to work on a certain metallic hued P40. So yes, he's uh, he's painting his now and I'm, I'm not really, I'm getting close actually to painting now, but here's mine so far. As you can see, my fuselage is done. It's all together. I've fitted the main undercarriage legs. I've fitted the tail planes. All I have left to do with this before I'm going to start looking at painting it is mask it and add the main flight deck windows. So, excuse me, what have I found along the way with this? Well, fit wise, as far as it goes with the, the kit itself, is very, very good. I think it's quite easy to see from this that there isn't an excess of filler work here. You've got inserts on the forward fuselage uh, where the here that's to enable the Vesda to have the emergency hatch. The later Herx had a fuselage side exit hatch around about here and it moved the position of this window slightly upward. So the other inserts have that detail on them. There's also an insert here don't focus on my hand camera, please. This one is for a choice of the early style intake. This is for the flight deck conditioning unit, air conditioning unit. This is the early style intake, simply a knacker duct in the side of the fuselage. And the later ones have got the, the pod on the side, which forms the intake. Going back to the sponsons here, the kit provides alternate sponsons. This again is the early one, and uh, that being the knacker duct for the cargo bay air conditioning. The sponsor for the later C-130H, and indeed the, the J, which is hopefully to come, has an intake at its forward end rather than this knacker duct. These just dropped on. You can see that white band there. That white band is the good old Vallejo model putty. When I put this together, I managed to have a very small gap there and I've just chucked a bit of that Vallejo putty in there rather than muck about filling and sanding it. Further back again, the air deflector door here is another drop in part and it does just drop in. Uh, it's not a completely perfect fit, but it doesn't really need to be. It's certainly good enough. Now this, this version purports to show the 
rocket assisted takeoff assembly mounts. They aren't quite right for an RAF aircraft. Um, and I haven't modified it on this occasion. This is a this build is absolutely out of the box as this is a build for hobby for the hobby company uh, for their use at um, uh, shows and then and, and in their building. So it is a hundred percent out of the box. I'm not modifying anything. Um, so they're not a hundred percent correct, um, but they they do give the idea. To be fair. The wheelbag detail on this kit is far superior to that that was ever in the um, earlier kits. It's actually quite accurate. Um, still basic. There's still a lot more you could put in there. But for what's visible, if you have the undercarriage pan um, door panel in its normal position, it's really pointless doing much with that. So on this side, I've fitted the paratroop door. You can just see it in here in the open position. I mentioned on one of the earlier shows where I've talked about this kit that uh, the mountings are inside there to allow this uh, the door to be fitted thus, which is a new one. Most kits, the kits I've looked at before have not had that facility. You can see that the sidewall detail at the back here that's included in the kit is, is pretty decent. You've got your auxiliary hydraulic pump there Sorry, the light's not helping me here, is it? That's the reservoir. These canisters are actually emergency water canisters. Uh, shouldn't be black. Sorry, Vesda, you got that wrong. Um, and then on the other side, you can see equally we've got some detail. This is chain bins, more emergency waters. And the red box at the top is the uh, stowage for the emergency undercarriage extension kit. All good stuff. It is broadly speaking quite accurate, quite well placed, and again, it's a good, it's a good start point for a, a more complete build, shall we say? Should you want to, so I've fitted my cargo door. This is the cargo door, the top one, uh, in the open position. My ramp is going to be open as well, and this is potentially a, a bit awkward. Um, there are no uh positive location points for the cargo door when it's fitted in the open position like this when it's fitted closed it fits beautifully uh, literally just you slip it in there squeeze the fuselage sides very slightly and it just it's it's a beautiful fit no no further work required when you want it open there isn't anything to attach it to on the inside at all so I, what i did at the back here I put a plastic card bridge across where the the aperture is, where the fin is, and I've used a <laughs> you're going to love this. I used a piece of blue tack at the back as a spacer, and obviously it's an adjustable spacer because you can just press it press it until it's right to hold this back part of the door level. It needs to be pretty much level with the tail at the front. Again, there's no fitment at all. So the only gluing place, if you go by, if you leave the kit as intended, is these two tiny corners here, which is going to be very, very fragile. So at the front here, again, utilising the sort of aperture in the roof, as it were, where the fin is, I cut a piece of spare sprue to length, cemented it down into that gap where the fin is, and then cut it off the right length so that the door sits on it. And then I've super glued the blue tack and the sprue rod to the door and just added a little bit of liquid cement in the corner. So this is now nice and sturdy. You can hold it, you can touch it. It's going nowhere. Uh, and that's in the open position there. The ramp, which is here, this is the ramp. Again, there's no... There are no positive locations for this in the open position as such. It just kind of sits there. But the actuators or the rams are included in the kit. So in between hooking it onto the back of the fuselage here and the rams should be able to make it reasonably sturdy. So that's all pretty decent. Quite happy with that. The tailplane's fitted very, very well. They're very nice. 
Complaints here are few. However, the elevators on the C130 will always droop downwards when the aircraft is at rest, unless the control surface gags are fitted. That's because they weigh something somewhere over 300 kilos each, and they will literally just fall under gravity. There isn't uh, the hydraulic system when it's when it's depressurized won't hold them in in the neutral position. So really and truly, any any model of this aircraft on the ground should have drooped elevators. Secondly, the joint, the tailplane joint, both underneath and on top, it is very, very good. There is, you can see a little bit of putty there, but that's actually in the sink marks. But you do need to get rid of it. You have to eradicate that joint. There is no joint here on the real aircraft. It's the fairings and the, and the panel work go across all of the joints. You need to get rid of it completely. Excuse me. Not a complaint per se, but it's just a point to note. Another point, the beaver tail, if you want to call it that. The kit instructions would have you fit the short rounded version for the RAF bird. Uh, having looked at photographs of XV215 when she was out in the Gulf, Gulf 1, the longer tails were fitted at that point. They didn't have, they didn't appear to have the missile warning system attached to them yet, but it did have, definitely have. They all had the longer beaver tail at that point. Moving up to the fin, got so much dust on this. The rudder, another huge control surface. Um, and again, will virtually always be deflected one way or the other, simply because wherever, wherever the prevailing breeze is on the given day, the rudder will, will push over. It's just a fact. Here you can see my closed parador in position. And again, fits very, very nicely. No real effort required to sort that out. Moving to the front, the radar. I did trim mine a little bit to get a better fit. Um, Drew reports that his dropped straight in. This is his variance in the kits. I've uh, used a piece of tape on the front here uh, because... That joint with the ray dome there, that's, it hinges upwards when you open it to access anything inside there to fit armour or to mess about with the radar. Um, it hinges upwards and that there is like a rubber panel there that hinges with it. So you don't need, you don't need the joint line scribing back in there. You actually need to cover it up. So I've just stuck a piece of tape on it and then covered that over with liquid cement. So that both makes the panel look raised and it also covers up any trace of the joint. I've so far only fitted the forward windows and you can see I've sanded across them. I've just knocked off the edges to make them, just to blend them in a bit more. I'll polish those back up, but I'm not fitting the rest of the windows until I'm completely done with all the sanding because I don't want um, debris getting stuck to the insides of them with static. But again, you can see with this model that the flat areas of, around the nose have been modelled really nicely. The radome's got that slight sort of hooked beak effect that the real thing has. And it comes to a nice... It doesn't come to a point. The previous kits have all been a bit fat at the front. The Hercules isn't bulbous and fat at the front. It is quite, quite streamlined at the front. And on that note, again, in previous chats, I've talked about this chine rail and how this kit has modelled the, the angular nature of the lower fuselage nicely, which it has. But I will go on to say now, I think that the transition between this chined area and the rounded front fuselage is a little bit harsh on this model. Um, on future builds, I will blend this in a bit more according to photographs, but certainly by the time you get to flight station 245, which is just here, this area is completely round. There isn't really any trace of that chine there or shouldn't be. I also think, and this is just my personal view, I could be wrong. I'm probably not. It's difficult to show you in, it's difficult to really show it in an angle, but I th the belly is a little bit flat. It could, could do with having a little bit more curvature across the belly. 
Um, again, on future builds for myself, I'll use a piece of plastic crowd across the middle and blend it in just to give it a bit more relief. Certainly here, where the sponsons join the belly, if you're underneath there looking along, there's a very, very definite difference in contour. The, the bottom of the sponson is flat and it goes into the curved belly and it is very, very obvious that it does that. But these are minor gripes, you know, this is a, all in all, this is streets ahead of anything we've had before for C130 wise. All of the other kits are just drastically horribly wrong in some area or another. This one, yes, there's minor, minor issues, but that's what they are. They're minor. I've already made the fuel tanks a very big feature of the early RAF birds, and now our Jays have them as well. Um, the kit includes alternate parts to fit the rear here, so you can fit the ones with the flare boxes or the ones without. I've also constructed the four engines. And again, previous kits, the engines seem to be a real... I don't know what it was about Hercules engines that nobody could get right, but they were all just awful. These These capture the nice... They're slightly wider at the top and they taper down in a nice curve to the intake. The intake looks really good. The length is correct. <laughs> Again, I don't know why, but all previous kits, the length, they're either too long or too short. They're just terrible. And it's got that sort of nice sort of downward slope along the top. They're, they are very, very good. However, the nose piece of this nacelle is separate. And there is no panel line where it joins, which leads to some quite quite awkward sorting. You, you really need no trace of this panel line to be visible on the finished model. There is a panel line back here, and I'm led to wonder why Zvezda didn't break, break the nacelle just here, where there is meant to be a panel line, and it could have been quite easy to deal with, or it could have just been left. I also found with my all four of my nacelles, I added a, it's around about a half millimetre plastic card strip in that top joint. And I did that because my nose pieces were wider than the assembly nacelle. And also because I've got a front one. No. When I offered them up to the wing, they would rock from side to side quite a bit. They were basically too narrow for the aperture on the wing. So I added the plastic card to alleviate that and on the inner pair of engines I've also put a piece of cocktail stick in you can see you just and that's just bracing the sides of the nacelle outwards a little so that they properly fill the little cutaway in the wing before I did that there was quite a lot of wiggle room there again minor stuff it's, it's easy fixes uh, some would argue that you shouldn't have to do it Again, Drew says his went together absolutely fine. So, pay your money, take your choice. With the wing, it's too long to fit in the picture. Quite a chunk, isn't she? Uh, we've got the D panels moulded in here. Uh, uh, they end a little bit abruptly, but I'm not going to complain too much. They're, they're pretty decent e effort other than that. The, the nacelles slot into these little recesses, so that makes um, any any problems with that join will be relatively easy to fix because of that. On the top, the outer, this is the central section that goes between my thumbs, and then you've got two outer panels, and they overlap with the, the full span sort of lower wing halves, and then you've got a sort of rib shapes here and here which glue to each surface so it's a reasonably sturdy structure it's not super strong it's not like airfix would have had spars in here and it would have been rigid as hell it isn't that rigid but it's okay it'll do the job now this joint here in the top sur top surface is actually where the wing brake is on the real thing so you would say, well, that's good. You don't need to worry about that joint. But unfortunately, you do. <laughs> because on the real aircraft, this section here has a separate panel. 
It's called the rainbow panel and it covers the joint area where the wing bolts are. Because bear in mind on the real thing, all of this back here is false work and all, all of this is leading edge. So the actual wing structure is only from here to here. And this rainbow panel covers the area inside where the wings physically bolt to the centre wing. It's called the rainbow panel because um, of the arch shaped cutaways in between each bolt. So all I'm going to do is get a piece of super thin plastic card, maybe a piece of foil or even a piece of tape and make a panel to fit over the top here because the panels on the real thing, they're not raised, but they never really fit all that well and they get dented and manked up. So, And I'll make a rainbow panel. And then this bit aft of the rainbow panel, that joint needs to be dealt with because, again, there isn't one on that piece of structure behind it. Other than that, pretty much golden. You've got the centre escape hatch there. I've deepened it because the scribes on it were very, very shallow. So all of the panels that are separate panels on the real thing have been deepening with the scribe to make them stand out from the, from the remainder of the panel lines. Uh, and then the one last curious feature again, all of the Hercules models, they, they seem to insist on providing this under camber here. Uh, if the rear wing has under camber at all, it really isn't pronounced. I'm at a loss as to why model manufacturers insist on doing that. But again, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. It's underneath after all. Uh, and it, when it comes to fitting the wing to the fuselage, it is... Don't break it, woman. Very, very good. The contours almost match across the top, but you can see that that joint is very, very decent. But again, you do need to get rid of it. And underneath, uh, the joint's lost in the light look. But again, it unfortunately is in a position where if you're really, 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 really worried about accuracy, you're going to have to get rid of it because the armpit panels stretch from here and come down, so this shouldn't be a panel line. I'm going to ignore it, don't tell anyone. I did toy with the idea of not fitting the wing uh, until after paint. I've, I think given that the, the joint will need to be gotten rid of, I think I am going to fit the wing before paint, but what I am going to do is leave the engines off. That way, there's still good access for masking and painting the camo and what have you. Bearing in mind that I'm, I'm doing the Royal Air Force Bird and it has that deeply irritating <laughs> sort of mid-period RAF camo where the camo wraps over the leading edges onto the lower wing and it's a right pain in the bum. So I want to have good access to be able to get, get in and mask things nicely. So I think that's how it's going to look for paint. And I expect all things being equal to being in a position to start putting paint on this within the next week or so. And of course, I'll update as I go. So there we go. That's it for today. Uh, overall, very, very pleased with this kit. I'm so happy it's finally come along. We've finally got a decent C130 kit. Um, Having spent 16 years of my career working on them, it, uh, it's something that I've long wanted to be able to build. And up to now, every time I've tried to build one, I've had to throw it in the bin because it's just too irritating. <laughs> so <laughs> I've done well to get this far on this one already. Um, but yeah, looking forward to pushing through and getting this one done. As I mentioned, I'll be doing XV215, which carried the Viz artwork for Fat Slags on the left side of the nose during... Gulf War One, and was rapidly painted over when when that operation finished and they all came home. Um, but I've managed to find quite a few half decent photographs of the aircraft at that time, so I can have a good understanding of where I need to go with uh, weathering and fading and whatnot. Uh, and obviously, I'll I'll go through that that as well as I go along. So that's it for now. Um, I'd like to wish you all. The very best and have an excellent weekend wherever you are keep yourself safe stay well and i'll see you next time so that's it for now genesis out